In my mother's dresser was a box with a gold top, and inside were the oldest of the family photos. I'd spend hours looking at the picture of Ethel, my mother's mother, with her chic hat and her struck pose, arms spread wide and legs crossed, a little round. She was a mystery. Years later, I realized she wasn't fat. She was pregnant, 17, in high school in a rural community in South Dakota, and pregnant. We never talked about it. It was one of the many things you didn't talk about. Even though the world in 1922 had plenty eight-pound babies, born seven months after the wedding and called premature. When mom died, I found the few things left of Ethel's, a medal from a violin competition, a newspaper clipping, and a thin green book, a young wife's diary. The clipping announced that Miss Ethel Duffel, Duffy had returned to high school from a holiday as Mrs. Otto Sievesen. No one talked about the rest. She didn't get to be a mother long. Otto's mother made her life a misery, and with my mom, an infant, and her parents and sisters in tow, she fled to Portland, Oregon, remarried, and died all by the time she was 20. For my mother, Doris, being an orphan meant she had to figure out the rules all by herself. She didn't have a thin green diary, but she had Ladies Home Journal, and the red checkered cookbook, and Donna Reed. Anything that didn't seem to fit the perfect family image you'd imagined, it was better not to talk about. I don't want to give the wrong impression. Mom was funny and warm, a fierce mama. She had a great marriage, a career, and wherever she went, she made friends and created community. But she was also a keeper of secrets things you didn't want to admit, you just might make something up, like meeting dad at the hospital where she'd been taking care of a friend of his, or the boy who lived with us for a short while before he was sent to reform school, the one with wavy auburn hair just like dad's. He was a foster child because it just didn't fit meeting your divorced husband in a bar, a delinquent stepchild, it's hard for family stories that haven't been told to emerge. So you listen to the silences. You snoop through papers. You put two and two together. Later, you probe a little. Mom, those cousins with the crazy mom who put nuts in jello, were they abused? And she thinks for a minute, and then she starts to cry. As long as you didn't talk about it, it might not have happened. But once you did, the revelations keep coming. She makes you and your sister look at the scar where her breast once was. You tell her you're getting divorced. She says that you and your father have been worried about you for years. The grandchildren stop wearing long sleeves in summer, and she survives their tattoos. You tell her you had an affair. She says she's glad someone loved you during that hard time in your life. You no longer need lies or withholdings to feel safe. Finally, you let each other know each other, everything there is to know. There are no more mysteries. When your sister calls to say that mom has fallen, that things are bad, you pray the whole 90 miles there that you'll know what to do. And you walk in, and you do. You ask her if it's time to turn off the defibrillator that keeps her heart in rhythm. And she says, yes, it is, please. In the emergency room, her weak old great-grandson comes to meet her and say goodbye all at once. The defibrillator is turned off. You take her back to the assisted living place she's been in since she started declining. You share some pineapple sherbet and watch American Idol, and then you help her into her softest pajamas. She's in your arms when her big heart can no longer contain all that love. 
It heaves its last shuddering heaves. The aide calls your sister, who's there in a minute. And as you say together, our Father, who art in heaven, her body softens. At the end of the prayer, you lay her down gently, as she had done you so very many times. Listen, there's only one story now, one truth, the one that has always been, forever and ever. Amen.